So on this episode, we're talking about cultivating curiosity. And I am joined by three wonderful guests that's gonna introduce themselves. Cause that's what we do. We don't enable, we encourage people to represent themselves. So starting with you, Jordan, name and what you do. Hello, my name is Jordan. I'm a family therapist and social worker and service manager in Wandsworth. Lovely. Hi, I'm Sophie and I'm a social worker and family help in Wandsworth. Hello, I'm Charlie and I'm a team manager in family help in Wandsworth. So as active practitioners, um, managers and support, we're going to talk about this buzzword. For me, curiosity, it feels like it's a new concept. I feel when I qualified back in the old days, I was not using that word curiosity. I just got on with it and knocked on the doors. I looked in fridges. I was a bit a bit nosy. That's what it was. For me, it was nosy. And then systemic stuff came out. And I'm looking at you, Jordan, because, you know, your systemic <laughs> specialist here. Okay. Curiosity came about. And then I feel like, is it a word that's going to last in social work? Or is it a word like demure? Are we just going to hear about it for a few years and then we're going to move on? I'm trying to work out what is it to be curious in social work? And how do you want to see it reflected in like assessments and practice? I'm going to start with you. Yeah. Okay, um, I think there's lots of different parts to curiosity. I think there's an element which is about self-exploration and thinking about ourselves and how we have different lenses that we see the world through. Um, no two humans have the same experience, right? So I think we have a multitude of selves. I have a gendered self, a racial, a, a racial self, um, a sexual orientation self. And each of those parts of me inform how I see the world and how the world sees me. So. When it comes to writing assessments, understanding families, it's important for us to be curious about what biases, what stereotypes might we bring from our own identities and how might that shape how we're understanding family relationships, dynamics. So, so when you say a lens, it's the way in which I look at things, basically. So, for example, using me, I'm a young-ish black woman. So when I go into a household and I, for example, if I was doing an assessment as a social worker or a practitioner, a health visitor, my experiences as a youngish black woman would influence the way in which I like assess. Mm -hmm. But is that fair? Because families want continuity mm -hmm. and for fairness. So if I go in and Sophie goes in, we're seeing different things. So how, how does that work? Yeah, but that's why curiosity. So in sort of family therapy history, there was initially this concept of neutrality. And then curiosity came in to almost replace that because the kind of position was we can't be neutral. We can't, we're hardwired for bias. So what we need to do is we need to develop practices that help us to challenge that. And curiosity was seen as the way of doing that. So how are we being self-reflexive? So thinking about how is my, how are my experiences and my identities, my attitudes, my beliefs, the culture I've come from, how is all of that maybe shaping the things that I might pay more attention to or less attention, the things that I might get quite emotional by or kind of things that might resonate for me the things that I might not be as interested in automatically seeing. So you might have to work a bit harder to kind of be curious. So that discipline of always being curious, always asking yourself questions, what is it about me that might make me be invited to think or see that in a certain way? Why am I perceiving the risk in this way? How might that be linked to some of my own kind of attitudes or beliefs or my upbringing? Yeah. So Sophie, when you knock on the door mm. of a household or you've introduced yourself and coming around at four o'clock, yeah. how do you put on that curious hat? I mean, I do think it starts from before you even meet the family. Um, I think like for me and my generation of becoming a social worker, curiosity from the start of it was kind of drilled into us. And the idea that we have preconceptions about families, we have preconceptions about certain parts of identities and it may influence the way that we work with families. I think for me, something that has been quite important is to not make will try not to be influenced too much by what's already on the system if the family is already known to children's services. So being able to build that relationship and form your own impressions of those initial interactions because I find that if there's a family that's been well known to children's services and there's lots of things on the systems and there might even be things flagged up on the system about certain behavior that a family member has displayed, it can shape the way that then you approach that family and the interactions that you have. Um, and I think that can be quite dangerous. So I think try and go in with as much of an open mind as possible 
when meeting with families for the first time. I mean, I think it is important to be th aware of things such as risk, but to limit how much you know about the family beforehand and kind of decide that you're going to go in with an open mind and you want to be led by the family and what they're going to share with you about their experiences and what you can pick up on. And that's it. What if they don't want to share? Do you feel, do you really feel nosy? Do you feel that you're going in there and is it uncomfortable to ask those questions? Like, oh, why is it that you've got that over there? How, mm. What does that look like when you actually go in? Do you have that anxiety? Yeah, I think so. I think also the kind of initial visits with like every family, there is an element of anxiety. But I think those first visits are about gathering information anyway and, fi and um, building that relationship. So they may not trust you at first. And I think it is taking that relational approach and thinking about how you can warm the context so that you can have some more difficult conversations or you can, you feel comfortable enough to point something out rather than going straight in and being like, what's that? Like, why is that there? When you say warm the context, what does that mean to layman's? Um, I think when I say about warm the context, I mean about kind of stripping it back to just having those normal human interactions kind of being honest about your role and why you're here um, and being transparent about that, but being able to have like a relationship despite that and just name why you're here, name the concerns are, understand and appreciate that all, all conversations might not be that easy to have as well. And I might say things that they may dislike um, and they may not feel comfortable sharing certain things with me and that's okay. So giving them the option, I think. Especially early on in the journey, isn't it? Because they don't know you. And then Charles, I'm, I'm wondering as a team manager, you've got to support social workers, practitioners, and even other agencies that might be struggling. So for example, a health visitors going into the family and they've got the best relationship, but they might not be as curious because they're not necessarily trained to do so in their practice. How do you encourage curiosity with those that you support? Well, I think it's, it's firstly about acknowledging self. And I think that when we're having those conversations, it's just as Jordan was saying, is actually acknowledging where are you coming from, first of all. And, and just because you're coming from it from a team manager's perspective or a social worker's perspective or indeed a systemic practitioner, um, you do that no matter who you are. And so if I'm a health visitor or a what tends to happen as a team manager, your interaction with someone who is in the multi-agency is usually an escalation. So they they are worried in some way for a child and they don't think the social worker is containing in, in, in that sense. And so they want to, to have a conversation with you. Um, so immediately I'm going into that situation saying to myself, what, what am I bringing into this from, from my perspective and my lens? Um, and then if, if, if we're going in with that attitude, then actually helping them sort of come from that perspective as well, um, might help offer them some form of containment. Because normally, I think we're frightened by what we don't know. And I think that being able to come to an understanding about what we do know, um, an understanding about why we're practicing in the way we are, um, because I think there is still, I think it's changing. Um, we work with some absolutely fantastic um, health visitors um, and, and, and schools at the moment who, who really are understanding the way that we're trying to work differently. Um, but it has been a journey. But it's about sometimes the fear of what you do know, because it's what you do with the information. Sometimes asking the curious questions will open this Pandora's box of things that you don't know how to manage. And it's about not only the curiosity, but it's the aftermath of what you find out. And I'm just wondering, how do you support everyone to feel comfortable to hold that curious risk even? I think you, you've got to acknowledge that every every facet of um, risk is going to be in some way creating uh, an emo emotive response. Um, and I think the more experienced you are, I mean, again, Camilla, as you well know, we worked together that when we were practicing, it was all defined by risk. Yeah. And so for me, that risk word. feels kind of like, I feel, I feel comfortable when I hear yeah. risk. I'm like, oh, thank God. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but actually taking the step back is, is probably the thing that I've had to learn and develop, which right. is something I think like uh, Sophie um, in, in her training is, become far more sort of attuned to. Um, so I think really um, it's, it's acknowledging that you're going to have that emotive response and then being in tune with that and being okay with that. So for instance, you know, there will be triggers. Um, you know, for a lot of people, I think the classic example is when we get through the door, something really horrendous in terms of 
relating to sexual abuse. I mean, that, that does tend to be something that I see, and as a, as a supervisor, is something that f people feel contain, need containing by. But I suppose th the way that I reframe that is actually, it doesn't really matter who I'm working with. Um, I know that I, I need to be conscious that I'm going to have that preconception. But at the same time, if, if, if someone is coming through that I, I'm working with and I have a preconception about where they may be able to get to in terms of their parenting capacity, actually I need to I need to still give them the same opportunity I need to make sure I need even more so I need to make sure actually have you made sure you've done that gone that extra mile especially thinking about being ableist you know if you've got a family where um the parents have have learning difficulties I know it's a, a similar example for, for a family that Sophie worked with um where actually you know some of these key principles about like looking in and saying, actually, how much of this is about our understanding of ableism? How much of this is understanding about their parenting capacity? So, so really, really drilling down and understanding what, what that risk looks like, not ignoring it, but really being clear, okay, um, this is something that we can or, or we can support or, or actually evidencing that we can't, but not being driven by that initial response. Um, and as a manager, I think what I, what I try to do is, is try and offer that containment as a rule. So something comes in you know try and make sure actually we're not overreacting straight away as as the first point of call say okay and then and then try and come up with a plan and a solution about being action led just but just keeping the action away from the first port of call because i know as a practitioner when i did that that always led to escalation definitely and we're not trying to do that we're trying to support families where they are and i'm wondering jordan in this systemic practice how do we balance curiosity and privacy because one of the things that I remember when I was trained as a social worker, it was family has a right to a private life. That was always in my head as well. And I'm quite clear that I don't want to cross those boundaries. How do we balance the two? Yeah, I think ethics are so important. Um, for me, there's something about intentionality. So when you're being curious and you asked a question earlier about, uh, you know, what are the kind of things maybe that we need to be curious about? And what if that's unfair or how a family might experience that? Um, so we need to be intentional. Why are we asking the kinds of questions we are? What are the things we need to understand about this family in order to help them to change, in order to make things safer, um, in order to understand their experiences? Um, so I think being intentional is important. I think there's something also about how do you create a relational context whereby you can take risks, you can challenge, where you can tolerate having different opinions, where families can be curious with us and we can be curious with, with them. Um, so I like to do something called permission seeking quite a lot. Okay, what's that look like? To say Sophie was a family that you're going to, can you yeah. give me an example of what... Pref like action again. Yeah, right. action, I want to see, I want to see. Um, so Sophie, um, we have some difficult things that we might need to talk about today. Um, I wonder how I might be able to do that in a way where you could still feel respected and, and heard. Have you got any tips for me? And what would you say, Sophie, if you were a family? I want you to take the role now. Okay. <laughs> um, yeah, I understand that you're here to have some potentially difficult conversations. I think just allowing me the time to think about responses and if I need to take a moment, allow me to do so. Yeah, okay, so that would be helpful. Yeah. Yeah, and if, we were to, if I was to ask you if we could speak about your son today and what happened at school, mm. would that be something we could maybe talk about? Yeah, I'm happy to do that. Yeah. Okay, so pause there. So you, you might ask about the kinds of things you might talk about, right. but also how are we going to talk about those things? And it feels really respectful, though. It really does feel that you are now... I mean, what I'm curious about is if she says no. <laughs> Come on, Sophie, say no. <laughs> okay, let's say no. <laughs> say no, so, so, say no, say no. This reminds me of training. <laughs> Of course, okay. Sophie, say oh, no. you're gonna, I thought you were going to start with I, the no. Okay, no, I'm not no. happy to talk about that. Okay, okay, okay. I, I, I understand that. Can you help me understand a bit more kind of where that no's coming from? How would it feel for you if we were to have that conversation? What would you be maybe worried about? I just don't see the need why we need... I don't see why we need to have that conversation. Um, to me, I don't have any worries about my son. Okay. So are there things that you think it would be more helpful for us to talk about? Can you help me understand that? No. No. Okay, so you're not. It's a hard one, isn't it? She's hard. She's hard. I love it. You though. told me. You told me. I love it. I love it. So where I might go to that, right? So, so if I'm picking up some reluctance to talk about certain things, again, I'm being curious in my head, right? So we've got our outer talk and our inner talk. Yeah. So I'm thinking a little bit about 
your context, mm. thinking about our identities, thinking about power, thinking about I'm here as a, as a social worker, I might then start asking questions about what have your experiences been like working with social workers in the past? Mm. What's been, what, what are the things that have been really difficult about that maybe, or actually what have you valued and appreciated? If we were to go on in this relationship, what would you need me to do or not do? So I'm giving all of these opportunities to sort of collaborate on co-constructing yeah. the kind of relationship. I might name my gender. I might name certain parts of my um, identity and invite us to think about, we've got some similarities and differences. And I think it's the differences for me that, you know, we're in a borough, for example, Wandsworth is very multicultural. And what I find sometimes when I've been supervising um, is, is the comfortability in the barrier of especially race and culture and understanding in exploring curiosity. What's the tips and tricks? How can we get past those barriers? I think it's like one of the key things that um, that we've really been trying to do a lot more of in the last sort of six, six months is um, is seeing people as more than one thing. Um, and I think that's... that's like more than one thing, like what, a race or a... Well, I mean, I think sort of more than, so I suppose working with fathers, for instance, that, you know, so say that we have a, a, a father who is perceived to, as sort of like a perpetrator. Um, it's being able to see them through more than one lens and being able to see them actually as something other than what the risk might direct them for us to, to assess them as. So, um, you know, that's something that would be really key. But again, that's that's also across the board. So, you know, whether it's a, a young a young person who's come in, who's been searched multiple times and has been found in the, in the street or late at night with with people who are known to be, um, you know, involved with criminal exploitation. It's it's acknowledging that and acknowledging that risk, but actually also saying, well, what else are they? Yeah. You know, what else? Someone's are they? son, right? Yeah, someone's son. Someone's someone, friend, maybe someone's yeah. brother. Yeah, but also an aspiring, you know, yeah. carpenter. You know, how else can you build a picture of them that actually gives you a better sense of who they are? And that might enable you to build that, again, going back to Sophie's point, of that relational connection. Because it's a judgment as well. So some people, when it comes to the attention of children's social case, it's this feeling of being judged already. And, and I'm sure that is already a, a position of like a negative position is quite combative to then try and have these really, you know, gentle conversations. I think like coming from a position that was managing an adolescent team, sometimes you can't even be curious because they don't want you to know anything. You know, their, their whereabouts are questionable, so they don't want to rat someone out or snitch or whatever. How would you approach like the young generation in terms of curiosity when they are originally naturally shut down anyway? Well, I'm just thinking about like my practice and I do work with quite a lot of young people. Um, and what Charlie was saying about looking at individuals more than one thing, I think historically there's quite a binary way of looking at things in social work. So are they a risk, are they a protective factor, risk or resource, things like that. And that can get in the way of our work and our practice with people. But when I think about young people and maybe if there's been like intergenerational social work involvement, what are their parents' experiences of social work? What are their experiences growing up in a household where there were social workers, but there's been a high turnover um, and maybe they've had a connection with a certain social worker and then they've left. And I think, as you said, for young people, when it may be difficult for them to open up about certain things anyway, it can be even more difficult if they have those um, experiences in their life because it's about trust um, and I think to be able to be curious and to show that and have a relationship with these individuals we're working with they need to be able to trust us and what we're saying so I think it is a case of being consistent as well um, with young people and showing up you've got to I think something I've had to appreciate is that even if I say we're going to meet at this time they might not show up but but it's continuing to contact them continuing to persevere because for many of them, if they don't have um, trusted adults in their life, the kind of expectation is that you're gonna also just disappear as well. So I think carrying on, like being persistent, trying to make that effort and showing an interest, um, just like on a human level as well, goes a long way for them in terms of feeling able to trust you and open up about certain experiences, certain things that have happened. And I think as well, you know, being curious, for example, if I was a female and I had, um, 
I hate the word victim, but I had endured harm from my partner, um, perpetrated, you know, domestic abuse. If I was a male practitioner now coming to my house and asking me about that, how do we balance the sensitivity of those issues as well with being curious? I think it's difficult, but I think it has to be named. Yeah. I think it is okay, like you can kind of skirt around it, but I think that makes it more uncomfortable because I know some people, I mean, like even when you book to go to the GP, sometimes you're given like a preference to see a like male or female clinician. You don't necessarily get that choice in social work. Do you think we should though? I think so. I do think so. I think there should be an element of, well, I, it depends, I guess, like on the type of plan, maybe potentially with a family, because if it's meant to be like voluntary, like a child in need plan, and it's pro proposed as consent based, but you don't get any choice over the social worker that you're gonna get. As a team manager, how would you feel now allocating and having, <laughs> and having yeah. well, she says she only wants a male and I've only got one male. Cause yeah. you know, social work is a predominantly female heavy and, and a lot of the service, you know, care professions are female heavy. How do we, you know, you can pick a, fee, a male midwife. How many male midwives are there? Do you know what I mean? How do you work that? So I suppose from, I mean, I, I completely, agree in terms of transparency and, and being yourself and I think that is absolutely something that you should be doing and I think that's a way to help connect and build curiosity but it actually you know choosing based purely on gender you're, you're actually ignoring all of the other graces that come with that particular choice and I think that's the difficulty is that you're focusing in on one grace when actually some of the other social graces that may marry and, and you might be able to come over the barrier you might be able to have a transparent conversation about gender and that being the, the 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 main focus for that particular individual um but but equally i think that um we have to acknowledge that actually you know when we go in as a practitioner we're not just talking about um our biases we're also talking about who we are on that day like it's this idea that we're functioning at this sort of equal level at all times sometimes you're stressed <laughs> so, sometimes you've had a bad day sometimes you're hungry that is gonna and actually being transparent about all of those things actually you know are you going in and and saying to a family you know i'm really sorry actually we're, we're going to do something today because it's not my, you're coming to my house to assess me i don't care if you're hungry or you're tired or you're stressed <laughs> yeah. or you've got 10 on your caseload why are you putting yourself on me that that's but am Another I acknowledging that to myself when I go right. in? Right, so it's not necessarily to the family. You're not telling well, them about... Be. it could be. It depends yeah. on the relationship, yeah. I guess. I mean, there's some families that I have and, like, just get on so well that it feels like you could share things like that. I think there's an element as well, like, if um, a family feels comfortable, a family member feels comfortable enough to open up to you about something, sometimes it's about, like, taking that relational risk and sharing something back. Because old school social work, if I'm honest, you didn't say anything about yourself. You were really protective and you didn't tell them that you had a child. You didn't tell them that you were married. You almost took off your wedding ring or whatever. You did not give anything of yourself. And now it's different. Yeah. People are exposing themselves. I mean, but don't you think there's risks to that also? So for example, me as a mum, I'll say, do you have any kids, Sophie? And you go, no. Well, you don't know what we're talking about here. Do you know what I mean? How do we overcome that? Because then for me, then the curiosity, I'm like, it then becomes blocked. There is a, you've already put that fence up. I do think though, like, as like a young practitioner that like, I don't even need to open up about whether saying I have kids or not. Like, it's an assumption that families will make. And I've had that where they go, well, you don't have kids. Like, so why are you telling me? Like, what, why are we going down this path? Like, you don't understand. Yeah. How does that feel? It can be difficult. I've, not, I've not definitely brought that to <laughs> supervision. <laughs> yeah, I have. But even if you had kids, you wouldn't understand what the experience yeah, is for that yeah. parent and that family, yeah. right? Yeah. I don't know what your experience is like. None of us can really know what each other's. And that's where curiosity can be a real kind of uh, helpful concept and practice because you can hypothesize you can share your hypotheses you can share your thinking with people i'm wondering if you're feeling a bit like this have i got maybe on way off so you're, you're showing people that you can potentially try to get into their shoes and connect but actually that our ideas are always incomplete we don't jump to conclusions quickly and that in itself i think helps create a culture whereby within the relationship i'm not trying to judge you 
be critical, even if the role that I inhabit and the power that's sort of diffused within my role. And the reality is that I am an agent of the state coming into your home to assess because we think something, um, you know, that your child is at risk in some way, right? You can't escape that. You can't equalize power differentials. If we have a conversation about gender or about race, I can't equalize the potential power differential within that by talking about it. But what I can do is let you know that I'm cognizant of that. I'm aware of that. How can we try and have a relationship? How might that show up? What might that kind of do for us in the relationship? How does the wider society that we both inhabit influence on our experiences and, and the kind of relationship we might build? Because I was thinking, you know, sometimes we, we name when this sort of practice about naming things, you know, started, I found that it was really quite tick boxy. It was I am a white woman coming into your house. I appreciate that you're a black family. And it just became stuck there. And it was like, what are we doing about that? And what do we mean? And about, you know, asking the questions and being more curious and saying that what I'm, and hypothesizing, what I'm trying to ascertain is what is this experience like for you? Because even we're sitting on this couch, I'm the only black female on this, you know, and I wonder as a viewer, would you be thinking, oh, what do they know? They don't know what it's like as a black social worker going in or they don't know what it's like as a black family going in. There are so many barriers, but it could be the same for any of the graces. They don't know because they've not got disabilities. Mm -hmm. They don't know because they're not Muslim. We can never be exactly like the families that we support in any way. But it's how do we, as an, even as an organisation, manage the culture shift? Because I think there's been a culture shift in social worker and this borough, but how do we ensure that those that are out there know that culturally we are changing? Well, I think we have to acknowledge we're still on a journey for a start um, because I don't think that we're anywhere near where we should be. Um, but equally, I think that, you know, by modelling um, with our wider, wider professionals, um, because we do, we work day in, day out with a massive system of professionals that, that, that support children. And if we're modelling that throughout everything we do, that is going to filter down. Um, so I, I, I mean, I think we have to get better. Um, I think we are getting better. Um, I'm certainly learning a lot. Um, and if if that continues, then then hopefully we'll get to where we want to be. But yeah, it's, it's it's a way off. Can I jump on that for a second? So something that frustrates me as a practitioner is that we sometimes, or I noticed this, maybe have those conversations, and it's in some way under some kind of a negative connotation, or it's an intention to not be oppressive towards the family. So having conversations, naming differences and similarities. So like white social worker goes out with, uh, to visit a black family, names, I've noticed you're black and I'm white. Yeah. What, what does this mean for us? Yeah. Those are conversations are really important. It's important they're not tokenistic. Yeah. Mm. Um, and I think sometimes there is a fear maybe that social workers perhaps who are white having those conversations mm. that they're gonna cause more harm and oppress. Yeah. Um, for me, it's important we have those conversations because race, class, gender, we can think of all these different aspects, shape our lives, our everyday experience of being in the world constantly. So if I'm coming into your life as a practitioner, wanting to understand how do you do love? How do you do humour? How do you do family dynamics? What does it look like? What are the dances you lot do in your family? Help me understand. All of that's going to be shaped by all those aspects of identity, right? So I speak from my own position of I'm dual heritage, Arab and white British and working class. So I grew up in poverty. Those lenses I carry with me every day. Yeah. It shapes everything I experience. I come into this studio, my, my working class side of me is like, what the is going on, <laughs> right? It invites me to feel a bit uncomfortable, a bit out of place, like a space invader. So, so that shape, you know, that's a powerful lens. So for me, it's important that we're trying to celebrate and be curious about all the things that matter to you, your beliefs, the way that you, you know, look after each other, your values, how you kind of, how you live and breathe being a family, collectively and individually, because each person within that family is going to have a different experience as well, and a different set of identity markers. And, you know, I think it's important we also pay attention to similarity, because us three people here, um, I don't know if you guys are white British or if that's how you'd identify. But, you know, there's no one experience of being white British. There's no one black experience, right? It's all intersectional and unique. I think we all just have a very unique experience. So just when you work with families where you might perceive similarity, you also need to be curious about that and interrogate that in terms of your own ideas and prejudices, but also help, you know, creating space for that person to tell their story. 
And I think curiosity is all about stories. And I mean, there are going to be mistakes made, right? Practitioners, whether it be, as I said, in health and police, whatever, they're going to make mistakes and it's about reflective practice. How do we support into reflective practice, like learning from mistakes, would you say? I think uh, where we start um, is the first thing that we do um, is think about our own blind spots. Um, I think about my practice a lot um, because of the journey that I think social work has been on. I, I think you do as well. Yeah. Um, what it was ain't what yeah, it is. And what it was <laughs> and what it is now. I mean, you know, it was... Sometimes I think, well, I've qualified now. Like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. it's deep now, yeah. you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We were really surfaced yeah. before. I, I acknowledge now that I think that from a sort of personal and professional experience, mental health is something that I probably know more about than the majority of people that that, that practice in, in Wandsworth. So that is, but I also acknowledge that I may have experienced it. It's definitely my blind spot. Um, but in terms of learning, I, I, there's a particular um, family we work with where actually it took months for me to realise actually the actions that I was taking were probably informed by by my own my own graces and 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 as a supervisor that's that's difficult and then but but actually what needs to happen is they then need to have that discussion with the social worker it like at the end of the day thankfully there's there's enough sort of support within the organization that those things didn't make a significant difference to the outcome for that child but like we we get things wrong um you know it can haunt me to think about some of the some of the things i have done in my practice but ultimately you know if we're learning from them, we have to accept that we're going to get things wrong um, and be OK with that. It definitely is a barrier because I, so when I was started my training, um, it was like COVID, like I started, um, I did frontline and it was like a six week summer programme, all online, meeting like people that I work with now at Wandsworth, just over the internet. And you're expected over teams to have these like really personal conversations about your life. And then I think about families and then if we were having interactions like that with them yeah. in meetings, how uncomfortable that must be. But I think it's important to experience that discomfort yourself. Um, and I think that's part of it being reflective as well and having supervision and having conversations with peers. And if something has upset you, thinking about like why that is or why you thought about something in a certain way, I think um as well like when I joined we had like unit meetings so other people who did like frontline um we had this space and someone would bring a dilemma we had group supervision um in our team the other day um and I brought a dilemma to that and it's just helpful to have that space where people can think differently because of their own experiences that shape that and so Charlie do you have you found that supervising the old school social, social workers versus new school let's call them Sure, and they make me out people, isn't it? <laughs> no, no, no. Yeah. No naming and shaming. <laughs> yeah. Um, I definitely think that there has been a difference. Um, I think that when when I joined Wandsworth, it was a very different um very different set of social workers. I think that um there but I mean what I would say is that I haven't really worked with any social workers as a manager, which is a fairly long time now who haven't really been open to curiosity. I think it's really about providing that space and understanding. I know that I've worked with social workers who who have seen the role as a sort of referral to other services kind of job, which is very much back in the day what, what used to happen. But I think when, because it's upskilling. I mean, I think that really, you know, this, this idea that the social worker is the expert, um, I think can be quite rewarding um, and I think if that's fostered within the organisation and then within your your sort of um, immediate managerial um, oversight as well as within the team as a dynamic it can be really really exciting. How, how do you see the transformation of social workers that have started without the systemic training to those that end the programmes? No I guess I can't speak for everyone's experiences but what I would say maybe systemic practice offers is maybe some like a map, map and a framework maybe of the areas where you might want to be curious about and I think systemic practice is all about giving us as many options and trying to give families options so how can we kind of take different positions draw on different perspectives um, using curiosity because for me curiosity 
is robust and rigorous. I don't like this idea that when we're being curious, that's sort of in any way fluffy mm. or that's gentle. I don't think it is because if, if, yeah. if, if you're, first of all, we need to be curious to work out some stuff so that we can intervene to make sure children are safe. Safety is always the highest context marker, right? So we don't get to that point of knowing what to do before we know some things about what's happened, what's going on, mm. how's that impacted upon you, where are people now, right? We need the basic level of kind of like linear questioning to kind of establish a mm. base of information. It's like a relationship between knowledge and anxiety, yeah. right? And we want curiosity to be in that place where we acknowledge we can't know everything, so we can't be certain, but what are the things we need to know in order to be safe enough with the uncertainty that is always present. So for me, if we develop relationships and we use our curiosity to help us get into that domain and sort of have that state of being, which is where we want families, where we want families to get to as well. We want them to experience a sense of safe uncertainty because they don't know how their kid's going to behave the next day or how relationships are going to go out. Everything's unpredictable. What's going to happen in government? How is this change in tax or benefit going to impact or whatever, right? So how can you kind of like, I don't know, ride the waves that are unpredictable, but in a way where you can stay on your surfboard or whatever and not get sort of, you know. Not be thrown off by life's challenges. Yeah, yeah. So I think people that do systemic practice often say that they sort of develop a language that helps them understand particular maneuvers that they can make within relationships to uh, kind of better understand, better assess, build those relationships and then intervene to do something to change because that's the business we're in, right? I think it's unethical if we intervene in a family's life and we don't help them to change in some way. We shouldn't be there. You were talking about privacy earlier. Yeah. How do you measure that, though? Because, you know, it's all well and good us saying that we, we think our workers are being curious and we're supporting our workers to be curious. How do organisations or how can they measure the impact and success of curious practice? Is it even feasible? How do we do this? For me, an indicator that we're being curious is that we are... Throw in the idea of being comfortable in the bin. I hate that word. I don't think there's a place for it in social work. Uh, you have a right to safety as workers, not comfortability, I think. So do I notice practitioners and myself, am I modelling it too? Do I notice a culture of asking one question beyond what you might feel comfortable asking? So, you know, what's your window of tolerance? Are you stretching both with colleagues and with each other and with families? And that's how you build trust, right? You don't build trust in a relationship if you're playing it safe all the time. Mm -hmm. Same in any relationship. You need to push and, and stretch it. So for me, if I'm sort of looking at teams, do we have a culture within our teams where people are asking each other loads of questions? Are you taking risks with each other? Are you being curious about each other's graces? And I'm wondering what's informing your ideas about that. Mm -hmm. You know, would, would Sophie feel able to go to Charlie as her manager and say, Charlie, I'm mindful that you've asked me to go and do this, but you know what, I don't feel like that's actually the right thing. Can you help me understand where you're coming from? And I can maybe share how I'm coming from. And then we're getting into dialogue, right? Yeah. And then we can kind of deconstruct something. Um, so I like, you know, are, are we pushing? Are we challenging? Are we stretching? Are we being brave? And do we have the safety required to enable us to do that? But we also need to do that in order to build the safety. Because once they have that conversation, let's hope it goes well, I'm sure it would, <laughs> then you've got that trust and confidence like oh I know that I can do that with Charlie because mm, yeah. the relationship can then tolerate that episode of interaction yeah. mm -hmm. and you want to build relationships that can tolerate any kind of episode of interaction certainly with colleagues you yeah. know with families that's a more complex dance but they call it a risk for a relational risk for a reason it's because sometimes that's that's not going to work out and and it's okay and and I think being able to hold that and contain that and I think I would hope uh, I don't know, but I mean, I think my, my social workers that, that I supervise would probably say exactly what Jordan's just said. Um, and I would hope that they know that they have license to to do something that's a bit more creative and different in, in, the, in the event that that is the thing that helps connect them to a family and helps inspire change, and that I would support them with that. They know that we don't always agree. Um, but that's from whether that's the social worker, the recovery worker, or the um, child practitioner, and, and that's the beauty of family help, really, is that, that we have these different voices yeah. and every single one of those voices is, is respected. Um, and whether or not the power dynamic is obviously there, I'll offer you the containment and the organisation will offer you the containment. But you have the ability to share your voice and that will be heard, um, whether whoever you are in that sphere. And sometimes we invite, um, you know, practitioners from outside of the Wandsworth. We've had... Um, uh, deputy safeguarding leads from schools 
we did it with um, we did it with the children um, last month. We invited the children to come in and and participate in supervision. So um, you know there there are ways of 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 trying to break that barrier down and and acknowledging the power. The power is always going to be there but also trying to figure out how do we invite people to understand there's more than the power. So I'm not trying to be critical or condemn, but typically the police and their approach into families' lives somewhat obtrusive and, you know, they're very quite structured with their questioning yeah, because they have a job to do and it's based in criminality. But within the Safeguarding Partnership, what we're trying to do is support all families in Wandsworth to, for agencies that are involved in us to adopt similar practices. Mm. And we think that curiosity especially is one in which the police can benefit from. What's your views on police intervention and curiosity? So I think it's really important, you know, we value all of our partners, right? And that we develop good relationships. We do a lot of kind of collaborative work in. We each come with a different set of professional lenses yeah. as well as our personal lenses. We work from different, you know, legal frameworks, um, and all the rest of it. So I think there's something about how can we develop relationships when we're working with the police mm -hmm. and other partners where we can understand their priorities, their language, their lenses, how they're looking at things. If we can establish those relationships, I think we're more likely to influence each other so we can be more curious. Um, I think, you know, I was reading some research the other day about um, bias and it related to the police and there's some research uh, saying that 41 percent of police officers believe that negative stereotypes assigned to a particular social group are true and i'd be interested in what the research would say about just the lame person yeah. you know mm. and because it might not be that different right but when you're in a role like the, as a police officer or social worker you've got a lot of power yeah. and that needs to be kind of um, acknowledged what that intervention can do and the repercussions of that potentially. So something about how are you using curiosity to inform your decision-making in a moment where you, there might be a very high level of distress, there might need to be urgent action taken, which is sometimes context we're in as, as social workers, but the police and often the police in a different way, right? And that's quite scary. I and mean, I think about regulation and emotional regulation. And I know there's training that goes on in the US. I don't know if it happens here, often by social workers or family therapists, helping the police to regulate emotions, but also being reflective in the moment to think about what kind of questions they're asking, what kind of things they're looking for, how are they contextualizing what's happening in, in the moment. And it's not my job to tell the police how to do their job at all, right? Um, but when it intersects with children's social care, I think often our experience can be that uh, sometimes decisions might be made not with like a 360 yeah. kind of- But the argument could be they don't have time. We're out and we've been, you know, called out, 999, blue light, we've rushed in. We do not have the capacity, the time the, to sit down and think, okay, what curious questions could we ask? So I, I want us to be mindful of, t oh, go on, go on, fight me. Well, I mean, if I say, say we go back 10 years, let's, let's travel back. Yeah. We're looking great. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. If someone has said to you, when you were a social worker in those times, when we had very crazy cases, uh, Someone says, "Do you have the time?" That's true. We don't. We would said no. We wouldn't. Yeah, and, yeah, and we yeah. changed the practice completely, and that's suddenly true. we found the time. Ooh, I mean, I do I, like I, that. I, I think that's a bit of a cop out. Bit of a cop, cop out. out. No pun yeah, intended. Yeah. Get it? What? <laughs> yeah, that's <laughs> that's very nice. So cheesy. <laughs> yeah. Um, I think from from a practice point of view, one of the things that is difficult um, to to understand, and it would be really helpful for for a police perspective, is is the difference in what we see in police action yeah. in those moments and i suppose that's because i suppose if that was the same in terms of how social workers reacted i would be really worried about the continuity of, of practice so you know th there there may be a family where we're very very concerned and the police aren't or vice versa um but it doesn't what i can't see in my practice experience so purely anecdotal yeah. is i can't see a pattern among what what they're actually trying to do other than what we already understand unfortunately to be a pattern so you don't think there's enough change no but i'm gonna i'm gonna say one thing which is that um shout out to sheree uh, we work with a police uh team uh, around a particular family and some of the things that they did 
were so informed by what we would consider really curious practice. Um, so we knew that they were going to undertake a rape. First of all, they told us. Yeah, um, communication. So, so communication speed. was there. And secondly, they asked really, really important questions. They asked, are the children going to be there? When's the children's schedule? How do we make sure this is the, the least interventionist thing for those children? Because we know we need to get into that house for a particular reason. But how do we make it impact? What, what's the children's favourite sport? What, what's their favourite football team? How can we communicate with them that's going to allow them to feel a little bit better during this experience? They asked for a floor plan so that they knew where the children's rooms were. No way. So that when they did it, they made sure they didn't go straight into the wrong rooms. Like this was all preparation work. This is and, and a contrast me, to what I've heard. Well, this, this is I great. Mean, look, it's, it's a wonderful this example. But I mean, those police officers, they, they not only were, in my view, really, really good at their job, but they also really understood our context. And, and by understanding our context, I feel like they were understanding the children's context. So, so again, my point would be, is they, that is possible. Um, you know, there, there is a possibility for something different to happen. And I would say even from, you know, I manage the multi-agency training department and our least take up is from the police. We acknowledged that there was institutional racism built into our practice system. Black and brown children and families are being treated differently. Yeah. And that's part of a national picture, right? But we acknowledge that as, a, as an organization and stopped and slowed down and thought, right, what do we need to do about this? How can we change this? What are the different um, activities we need to do to put that ethics of being anti-racist into everyday practice? Because yeah. a value or a belief system is no good if it, doesn't, yeah. if it doesn't show up. What do you do with that? How do you show anti-racism as a social worker day to day in your practice, right? So we thought about that. We've come up with plans. We're operationalizing that. We're doing a lot of work. Um, I'm curious to understand what the partner agencies do if they're committing, because they all have some kind of mission statement about being anti-racist and anti-oppressive. And I'm not saying that they're not doing lots of things, but what, what is it that they're doing? And how do we understand what we're all doing? And how are there kind of overlaps? How is there some shared um, understanding of what we're doing? And then how does that get coordinated when we're working in multi-agency context? And I think we're building on that. So the part of the, the WSCP is we have working groups. One of them is an anti-racist practice group. And sitting on that, one of the chairs is uh, senior officers in the police. And our focus for this quarter, for example, is the disproportionality in stop and search for black and brown children. And as an action, we have to develop an action plan on how that's going to be measured, how the impact is going to be, you know, surveyed, assessed, whether it's be us doing focus groups with our young scrutineers to find out what's really going on and how do young people feel, for example, and to work out from stats you know, as a quantitative approach, can we see a difference in trend? Are there dropping numbers to the amount of stop and search? Are the same people being targeted again? And it's holding them accountable and shining a light on that for the next, what we're doing for the next three months. So we're hoping then to use that information and inform the system of this is what we're going to be doing. This is how we're going to measure it and holding the police accountable to making change. And if they're not making change, again, shining a light on it and encouraging and enforcing change. So I'm hoping things like that will, will have an impact. But again, this is just Wandsworth Police. This is a nationwide issue. And I think each borough has to take accountability about changing the practices and, and, and approaches and curiosities and training of their officers. Otherwise, there won't be change because a young man will walk in Lambeth, for example, just down the road, cross over and experience something very different. So I think nationally, a pan-London approach needs to be had on, on how especially people in high positions of power and influence like the police in those moments address families and, and take a more curious and interested approach. But I don't think it's, as you said earlier, we're nowhere near where we need to be. This is a work in progress. And it's by hearing from those that are in practice and those that are influenced by the change and measuring those, how we're gonna make a difference long term. So we hope we can make a difference and it's about using your voice um, and going to those groups and going to meetings and emailing your seniors and your leaders on, on the things you observe because at the end of the day you're the people that's working with families and telling people like me and hopefully I'll change the world. <laughs> I mean this for me has been a really eye-opening conversation to, to travel through time in social work and how we've changed and I feel that 
it's receptive and families are going to be warm and welcome into this approach and not see curiosity as me looking to see what you've got in your fridge as it was in old school to me really trying to understand you and stating where I am, where my lens is, what I'm coming for to influence the way in which we work together to manage risk and influence change. So I thank you for joining me on this conversation. It has been great and I hope to see you in another episode. <laughs> thank you.